Okay, one of the main facts I like to point out uh, here is that, you know, before the arrival of modern man to the Hawaiian Islands, large flightless birds foraged around the forest floor on native plants. They kept the underbrush maintained just as the pig, sheep, and goats do today. You don't see too much record of this because most of these birds were extinct by the time, uh, uh, I guess, botanists got in the forest. But I work up on Mauna Kea and I visited many caves where, in some caves, it's over three feet deep of these birds' bones. So they ranged all the way up to uh, 12,000 feet at one time. Okay, dialogue. I think dialogue is the biggest part, and that's the most trouble that I've had over the past year with the DLNR, is uh, you know, trying to get together with them and try to express some of the concerns that us as hunters and gatherers have. You know, and for mainly I'm going to talk with these threats to the survival of the palila. You know, and a lot of the problems that face the palila bird extinction, it's blamed about the sheep and the reduction of its habitat. Although, as you can see on these figures here, that a lot of this stuff is, uh, you know, predation. Um, even the cat scat, 68% respond to have bird parts in it. And I don't like to use the word feral because anything born in the wild is a wild animal. It's not a feral animal. It's not your house cat that escaped or, or whatever. Once an animal is born in the wild, it's a wild animal. So when we talk about sheep, they're not feral sheep, they're wild sheep. Uh, okay, this is a video. It's a short clip. This is uh, from the U.S. Uh, Geological Survey. This is a palila bird nest in the center. I know it's kind of blurry. That's the mother bird feeding the young. And they have quite a few of these cameras up in the uh, palila habitat. And within a moment here, you're going to see on the lower right, you're going to see what happens to the palila birds. These wildcats are designed to hunt these nests. Here he comes. As soon as the mom leaves, wappa, gone. Okay, I got footage, I got dozens of footage of this, of different cats doing this to the palila. Okay, it's, it's right there, it's eating the birds, okay? All right. The palila nest on the main trunks of the trees, so the rats and cats get right in there. And they watch the parents, the cats watch, because the grass is so tall now, because the ungulates are level is way down, yeah? So they just hide, they watch the parents where they fly in and out, and as soon as the parents fly off, whoop, they're right in there, gone. Okay, and also, uh, uh, rats has also been uh, <coughs> a big predator to all forest birds, yeah, in Hawaii. And then relocation FX, you know, when they try to relocate birds, the birds are a natal creature, so they only like to hang on in that particular habitat, so even when they move a colony somewhere else, eventually they either fly back or they die from predation. That's why their success rate is so low, yeah. And of course, weather effects, you know, the changing weather, you know, cold conditions. A lot of their habitat was lower in the ranch lands that have been deforested and used for cattle. So the ones, the ones that survive are higher up where it's colder, so they're more susceptible to those kind of problems. And of, of course, the drought affects all wildlife in Hawaii, including the palila. Uh, habitat degradation. This is a lot what you'll hear from uh, the environmentalists and conservation people. And this is where we come in with, if the state actually had a game management plan, you know, we wouldn't have a lot of the problems that we have today. And I always say we must also ask ourselves why something so fundamental to every other state is absent in Hawaii. And that's something I can never answer, my, even myself, I don't know. And you've already heard about carrying capacities and everything. And a lot of habitat uh, degradation happens when uh, unchecked populations in a given area, animals confined to a smaller range, fencing. So when you start fencing things off, they become more of a problem in that particular area. So fencing is not a very uh, efficient way either. And this is one of the biggest problems here, funding for game management. Okay, that's it. Funding for programs. Uh, this is the four major programs under the DLNR, yeah. So uh, this is what they get, uh, uh, 6.5 million from the federal and 2.5 million that just got passed by the House Bill 2012. So out of, so we get that and these programs get this. So follow the money. And then hunters, there's 18,000 licensed hunters in Hawaii. Average is probably $2,000 a year. I know guys that spend way more than that, especially if you've got good dogs and you know, all the care and feed and all that. So your costs can go up a lot. Uh, that's a tune of $36 million a year spent on hunting. If hunting goes away, what's going to replace that $36 million? Okay, this couple of these screens got cut off because I did this in, uh, on a Mac and I'm playing it on here now. But basically, uh, you know, no funding for game management plan, endless slaughter of our game animals, degradation of our land, and conflicts. And so no game management plan, lots of money for other programs, 
And here I says, do you really know what is going on in our mountains? And I'm on a sh this is where it gets, it gets bad. Okay, we got the aerial shootings, slaughters. And, you know, Dylan are here locally. I, I, I'm not here to bash them or anything. They try their best. But, you know, the conditions and everything, it's, it, this is insanity what they're doing, really. What, what, uh, was, what was that that you just showed? <laughs> that's piles of sheep that were just shot and removed. Okay. Uh, a big problem here is evasive weeds. Since the ungulates have been removed, this area here hasn't had any sheep or goats in probably 20 to 30 years. And as you can see, the landscape has not recovered. Uh, this used to be cattle at one time, and now it's all fireweed. And this fireweed is toxic to cattle, and it's spread all into Waikiki Ranch and everything. So eventually, it's going to spread all over, and the quality of ranch pasture land is way down because of this. Uh, and the cattle will die from this. Goat and sheep love this. And then we get to the fencing. Millions of dollars of fencing. And this is what happens to them. Okay? Unchecked fences for miles, funded by our tax dollars. Carnage. Hundreds of animals shot and left to rot. I blurred it a little just so it's not. There's a row of animals here, about 30 of them along a fence. They drove them up against a fence line and shot them all and left them there. These animals are trapped in a lava field, a five miles square in the impact area. So they'll die of starvation. This animal here, as you look down the road there, you'll see carcasses all the way down. And this is Maisie Arona funded this fence here, and she's proud of it, but I wish you would see the results of what's happening to the animals. This is like a death trap. This is like a gill net in the ocean, just trapping animals every day. And then, of course, the mass graves and the end game, babies starving when their moms were shot by helicopters. So now DLNR wants to eradicate our pua, our pigs, our substance, our culture. And people mentioned this already in the Hawaii Revised Statutes that aerial eradications of any type or any aerial shooting is illegal. Uh, DLNR response is that they can do it when it's proper and effective. Well, how they got around that is through administrative rule. And how many of you heard or had any input on this? I have asked old timers for the last 30 years because they've been shooting from helicopters for 30 years and nobody ever heard of anything. So through the administrative rule, all they got to do is go to the board, nat land and natural resources, the attorney general, wham, bam, it's done, and they can do whatever they want. They don't have to follow the, the, their own laws. Okay, the key word in, uh, in the Endangered Species Act is the taking. Okay, and why this word is so important is because the taking was to harass, harm, and everything, right? This is what they used to do the Palila versus DLNR. They manipulated these words because a, a sheep doesn't eat a, a bird. So it wasn't a direct effect, yeah? Okay, report to Congress. Okay, this is the overflights uh, effects. Okay, and this is public law. Uh, some of the biggest concerns is reproductive losses. And this is what's happening. The reason I'm talking about this is because in the past two years, they've increased aerial eradication to four times a year, two days. So it's about 16 hours you know, each time, two, two days in a row, and then a few months later, again and again. And they're flying over the critical habitat at treetop level. So the birds, the disturbed birds, they're flying away from the aircraft, they're leaving their eggs and young exposed. Birds that flush quickly are damaging the eggs, kicking the young off the nest. And just to give you an idea of what the helicopter sounds like, I got this from our guys in Kona, but it's, uh, I can't find a darn cursor. Where are you? At a higher elevation, they have to rev the engines up because there's not enough aero mass to keep the thing going, so this thing is just running balls out. They bring any carcasses down. And this is a muffled sound right now. Any of you have been in the military, you know. Now you can see how high above the treetop. When they're actually looking for the flushing the sheep out, they're flying at treetop level, blowing uh, air horns because the sheep are hiding under the trees. So you're over a critical habitat, a critically endangered species, and you're blowing horns, the prop wash, everything. And this is what's happening. Habitat avoidment right here. The animals are avoiding. They're, they're, they're abandoning their nests, and they're not coming back, and the young are dying. And even they're alarmed that observations by refugee biologists suggest that endangered polluted birds in Hawaii underutilize a sizable portion of its critical habitat because of low-altitude military aircrafts. This is old news. This is 1987. So it's funny how this data, it doesn't say polluted birds are abandoning their nests at an alarming rate. Population has dropped 70% since 2008. And that's when they started flying four times a year. 
So my question for uh, Chairman Willie Isla is that he may think that it's proper and effective, uh, but I wonder if the Endangered Species Act thinks it's proper and effective. Okay, and here's overflights again. The manner which indirectly causes harm. Now, this is the lawsuit. They were able to sue the state and get rid of the sheep because of this. The manner which indirectly causes the loss of an endangered bird over its time is so, so clearly a taking. Palila versus DLNR was the case. It makes it clear that no intent to cause harm to endangered species is needed. They didn't even have to prove that harm was being done to get the lawsuit to do that. But the DLNR can be doing what they're doing now, driving the species into extinction, and everybody supports it because it's an effective tool. Okay, right here, Sierra Club and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, they're criticizing the Army because the Army is doing, uh, they want to do landing flights over Mauna Kea, which flies over the critical habitat. Okay, Civil Club is concerned about the effects overflights will have on the Palila critical habitat. So they're worried about the military flying 2,000 feet over the critical habitat, but they're not concerned about aerial eradication flying 30 feet over it. So what does this have impact is having? Well, this is what's happening, the extinction rate. You can see as air, uh, the uh, increase in helicopters and the transition between the decline in sheep, the, the Palila bird is relatively steady from 1980s to 2000 or so, fluctuated between 5 and 3000. And after helicopter flights increased, um, even uh, commercial helicopters, because they, when they're doing maneuvers, I checked the PTA, when they're doing maneuvers, they can't fly over the military base, and the only place they can fly over is a critical habitat. It, okay, so the use of helicopters to eradicate ungulates from the pelila habitat is scaring off adult pelila from their nests, causing direct harm to the nestlings. The strong wind from the propeller wash, helicopter noise, and the use of air horns are startling sheep out from under the Momani trees. It's also causing the adult pelila to abandon their nests. The young are left to die in the cold or fall to predation. And balance, uh, a harmonious arrangement and do not exploit emulation or game animals. And a need for a game reserve. This is something Hawaii has never had. They can take lands out of use. They swapped 100 acres to make the Satterall Bypass for 10,000 acres of ranch land and $25 million for a Palila uh, habitat. That's some mitigation area. They're using only 1,400 of that 10,000 acres. If they can do that, why can't they give us 10,000 or 20,000 acres to have a game reserve? And we can have a place to hunt. We can remove some of these problem areas with animals and we can still maintain our species that we have here. And then my conclusion is uh, I recommend that Hawaii County and Council State, the DLNR, uh, has an immediate season desist on all area allocation until such time that a full investigation and proper field studies may be conducted.